This is Think Tech Hawaii. Right. Community matters here. Exciting. All right, five seconds. All right, the three o'clock rock. <laughs> this is Think Tech Tech Talks. I'm Jay Fidel, one of our favorite programs, and a couple of our favorite people because they're heroes. <sighs> okay, uh, this is Elliot Parks. He's the CEO of Hawaii Biotech. David Clements. He's the, what, product development officer? Director of vaccine research. It's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and they have news. They have news. It's really important what's happening. A little way in the background, you know, we, we've had, we have had trouble developing a pharma industry. We've been trying for 20 years to develop a pharma industry here, uh, as well as other, you know, tech type, science type industries that make money. And, um, you know, finally, there's a bright light, and we're going to talk about that right now, right here today. This is so fabulous. Okay, we're going to talk about Zika. Okay, this is a big revelation. How did we get to this place? Where are we now? We have a Hawaii company developing a, a vaccine that will be useful worldwide. And we're here on ThinkTech talking about it. What happened? Well, about 30 years ago, Hawaii Biotech was started by four faculty members from UH. And they did a variety of things. One of the things they wanted to do in the beginning was to develop a dengue vaccine, which is very complex because there are four different types of dengue serotypes. And so they had to build a vaccine that could protect against any, of, any and all of the four. And the positive outcome from that, a couple things came out of that. One is they developed a platform that we use to this day, we've perfected it, mm -hmm. to make uh, vaccines without viruses, so they're not infectious, so mm -hmm. they're, they're very safe. So this is a research tool? Well, it was a research tool. Okay. We, developed, we ended up taking the dengue vaccine into the clinic and then selling that to Merck, and we still have all the rights to the vaccine platform, and we've made a variety of other vaccines. Uh, the West Nile vaccine we st we've taken into the clinic. The other vaccines have not yet been in the clinic, but we look forward to that. So it's... If I get dengue, I could call Merck and get a, a drug that you guys developed to help me with dengue? Well, it's a vaccine. Merck's still developing the vaccine. Okay. And indeed, last week they announced a collaboration with folks in Brazil to advance that development. We had a, a bit of a, a dengue outbreak here a couple of years ago, yeah? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It wasn't in play, though. It, it wasn't to the stage where it could be useful at that time. No, the vaccine wasn't. No. Yeah, yeah. Now, a vaccine, my recollection, nothing about this, my recollection is vaccine prevents you from getting the disease in the first place. Precisely. It's not a cure, so you, it's a prevention. You have to take the vaccine before you get sick, before you're exposed. How, how does it work in dengue? Well, all vaccines uh, work by educating your immune response. We have a natural immune response. And as we age, we come across more and more things that are foreign to us. And our body recognizes that and learns to, to reject that. So you, you need help as you get older? Well. You need more help because your body reacts? Well, the, as, as you're older, something like influenza, as you're older, you've, had, you've been exposed every year to a new flu, so you build up immunity. Okay, so but we have a benefit also, there. But we also should get the flu vaccine every year. Yeah. And so, yes, older people have much broader immunity to flu, for instance, influenza, than younger people do. Mm -hmm. We're educating the immune response. And a vaccine just speeds that up. Okay, enter Zika. Zika, really awful disease. And we saw it in Brazil. We saw it in other places in the world. We saw mothers with great problems, and pregnant women, great problems. So you started working on that, uh, using, I suppose, some things you learned in, in uh, dengue? Well, David was quite, quite pivotal to that. I got a phone call from a collaborator uh, saying, you know, Zika's coming up, can you do anything? And so I talked to David the next, the next Monday, and we looked, into the, we looked into the genome because with sequencing, you know a lot about these viruses. You don't know which ones are gonna erupt, but you certainly know about them in the background. 
And David put together, David and the team put together a vaccine, which was one of the first vaccines that the FDA ever saw. Okay, so unpacking that a little bit, David. Um, so you, you, you get the genome of, of, from, uh, of the virus in advance. So you're working on lots of viruses, lots of genomes. Correct. <clears throat> and then when the time comes that you're, you're gonna seek out the Zika virus, you're ready because you have the yeah. you have the gene the genome. Yeah. So taking what Elliot's already said, you know, we worked on dengue, we worked on West Nile, and then Zika comes along. They're all in the same family. They're all flaviviruses. Knowing the sequences, we can sort of, as we like to say, plug and play. We take the specific sequence for the Zika uh, <clears throat> virus, then we take that and we plug it into our system. So as already mentioned, we have the platform in place. You know, we've done a lot of this work before, so it's just a matter of taking the right pieces and putting them together. And also, Elliot alluded to that we went to the FDA with this, and we were able to do that in roughly one year time, which compared to what we've done in the past was very quick. So that's one of the benefits we have, learning from all of the previous uh, uh, efforts that we've put together, that we can now much more quickly take things mm -hmm. forward and we've established a relationship with the FDA so that hopefully we can move things into the clinic and ultimately into products quicker. Mm. Well, this is very exciting. So maybe we need more on what the platform, the vaccine <coughs> platform is, because now you, you know the genome of the virus you want to catch, mm -hmm. um, and you, uh, you want to provide a vaccine. The, vac the vaccine would be what, with dead virus? So, no, in our case, so there's, there's Traditional vaccines, so you have the traditional vaccines, which are generally what they call killed vaccines. So you grow a virus, for example, you treat it with some chemical you, so that it won't be infectious, but it still has some structure to it, mm -hmm. and that's your typical vaccine. There's other live attenuated vaccines where you somehow or they come up with a vaccine that's still alive, but not enough to make you sick so that that serves as a vaccine. And sure, then- I'd want to be really careful about yes, that. Yes, you need to be, <laughs> in both cases, you need to be very careful and, and it requires extra work to, to ensure the safety of those. The way that Hawaii Biotech goes about it is we use recombinant DNA uh, methods and we can produce specific proteins from the virus and we do that in a manner which allows us to purify those. So only a purified specific protein goes into the vaccine. So it's very safe, non-infectious, and that's how we do our vaccine. So it's just simply protein. We have to use some adjuvants to help boost the immune response, but in the combination of adjuvant and the proteins, that's what kind of What's is. an adjuvant? An adjuvant is a molecule that helps to stimulate the immune system. So it ramps up your immune cells so that when you present it with this protein from the virus, it has an appropriate response so that you have antibodies that will protect you from the disease once it comes along. How do you know how much adjuvant to put into the vaccine? Something you have to test for. You know, there's, you know, many of the adjuvants have been uh, around for a while, so some of those are known. If you use some of the newer adjuvants, you have to do some studies and I guess you could say titrate, you know, or use different amounts until you find the right amount that gives you the optimal response. Okay, pretty exciting. So you're ready to go. Um, what, what starts you off on this? Um, it's, it, obviously, there's a need for it, but uh, somebody knocks on your door and says, what do you say, guys, we need a, a Zika vaccine? Uh, who is that knocking at your door? Well, we, we try to stay ahead of the curve, so to speak. And so if we hear there's something happening in Brazil or something happening in the Caribbean, that's a real stimulus so, for So us you're there. starting it yourself. It's, right. it's an entrepreneurial idea. Right. Because you know there, there are problems around the world. There are people who are getting sick. There's a need for a vaccine. So... Let's right. wake up on Monday morning and do the vaccine. And then you find that you're ready because you have the genome ready. You have the platform ready. It's like a really good story. <laughs> okay, and now you can, now you can manufacture it. <clears throat> so <clears throat> now you have it. You have the adjuvant. You have, the, um, you have the, the dead or the proteins. Protein. What do you do now? You've got to test it. And is that the trials that everybody talks about? Well, well to, to get to the trials, you have to go talk to the FDA first. So you go to the FDA and you present your package of how your vaccine works and the, what's in it, because that's what they want to know. They want to make sure you're not putting anything in it. 
into humans that would not be safe. So you have to go through that process and then you start your clinical trials. So there's a process that you go through to prove first that it's safe and it doesn't cause any harm. And then after that, you start asking questions of does it really work? Does it work? Yeah. yeah. So two stages to yeah. that. And then the third stage is you go back to safety. You expand the process and you do more so that you ensure that it's safe before the FDA will sign off on it. And, and you get people to participate in the trials. Correct. And that means here? Uh, typically... We, we've done clinical trials here. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we did our first clinical trial with our first clinical drug uh, a vaccine uh, here in Honolulu. Uh, but there are only a million and a half people in all the state. So you really need a larger population. So how many people participate in the trials? By the time you get finished with the FDA, FDA protocol, how many people? A couple thousand. A couple thousand. And it's not so easy to find a couple thousand in Hawaii. Do that. Right. And, and, and in our case, people who are naive to the disease. You know, we have a lot of people who have been in, in oh, Southern sure. Asia and other places that may have been exposed in the first place. And you don't want them in the trial. You want to, you well, know, when you say you naive, know. you mean they never had it. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, in, in, the, in the final stages of clinical studies, it's fine to have those people. But initially, you don't want that complicating factor. Right. What is it? Simple, yeah. logical, all yeah. that. So the FDA can clearly <laughs> interpret the results. The FDA is watching you all the while on this sort of thing. Yeah. Now, do you, do you, when do you get into the patent phase? I mean, somewhere along the line, you want to protect your work. I mean, this is not cheap. So, well, we're writing a grant, and David and I just were talking today about having to get a patent in place before we a patent filing in place before we submit the grant. Ah, okay. So you want to file for the patent, submit the grant, but you're already in touch with the FDA. Uh, right. And well, so, they're, they're two separate events. The FDA is is one thing. Patenting is a whole different uh, well, my process. My question is, through. can you trust the FDA not to reveal your technology? Well, if, oh, yeah. if we have a patent in place, we're not yeah. very, very concerned. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Your patent should be in place before, before we even disclose, talking to the FDA. Yeah. Before we disclosed anyway. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Although I, I, this might be a good point, good place to point out, we have close collaborations with UH especially uh, the folks in tropical medicine. Mm -hmm. And we collaborate with them on a routine basis and we share patents. Yeah, yeah. let's talk about that. So uh, JAPSIM actually helps you out. Oh, in what way? Because oh, you he, have your we, own we laboratory. We help each other out. <laughs> okay. Well, for, for instance, on an Ebola vaccine, we have a, we have a patent on, the, on a way to make an Ebola, Ebola vaccine and we license that to UH and they're doing the development You're working work on, on the Ebola? Oh, indeed. Vaccine? We have to have another show very soon, Elliot. All right. <laughs> Let's do that. So but th there's an example because, um, I mean, we're happy to pay for the patents. Sometimes it's hard. Having, had, having been in the academics in the past, it's sometimes hard to find the money to, to pay for patents. It's not cheap. And we're happy to pay for the patents. They can do the development work with us. You know, they can do really great science, and we can do the clinical work. So you, you spent a year in, in putting it together, putting the concept and the, the, the platform development aspect of it together. Now it's gonna. Now you're in trials. Uh, how long does it take in trials? Two, three years? What? More? Less? It all depends on the disease and the incident, and you know, there's there's factors. I would say five years minimum. Wow. Um, it could be even more than that before you can get through all your trials. If you if if, if we had a big outbreak say in Zika, which could happen, I think. Right? Any virus could, you know, what's the word, change. And, um, um, and then, then you have an immediate problem. Uh, could, could that five years be shortened to something shorter? Well, the FDA has some emergency provisions that we don't, commercially, we don't rely on those, but if the occasion arises, we'd certainly use it. It might happen, yeah. yeah. It was, it was, it's been implemented on the Ebola. Uh, in the last sure. outbreak, uh, there was a vaccine that wasn't licensed yet, but it was in development and they brought it out and started trials with that during that outbreak and they're still continuing that today. Yeah, but again, as in, well, uh, Ebola, Zika, these are vaccines and somebody who's already sick isn't going to get better because right. of the vaccine. Right. You have to catch them in advance. That's but right. you like to catch them in a, in a vector situation where you know that they're Going, they're likely to be exposed. Yeah. Right. Well, and for and for healthcare workers, oh, for sure. instance, Before who are you working send them into on, the field, yeah. on on Ebola patients, you know, we need to protect them. Right. Well, you need to have them. Therefore, 
it, it really pays to protect them. Right. <laughs> so it encourages what, them to, to take that from, assignment. Where, sorry? It encourages them to take that assignment. Yes, right. Or it avoids the discouragement and the, and the fear of taking that assignment. Right. So um, where, where does it go from here? I mean, where does it go from here in terms of uh, your effort? What do you have to do? Um, and where does it go from here uh, in terms of getting to the public? Well, in the, in the short term, in terms of development, um, there are several agencies that are willing to support vaccine development, uh, from the federal government to the Gates Foundation to the World Health Organization, a Welcome Trust, et cetera. But they all want to see evidence that, that this is probably a viable candidate. Mm -hmm. So we entrepreneurially have to do that spade work, and then we try to sell the project to one or another of those agencies. That's what gets us, gets the, the expanded development time. Um, and then ultimately, in our case, we're happy to work with a, a large pharmaceutical entity that has the ability to distribute, to manufacture and distribute around the world, because that's really not, not where Hawaii Biotech is now and we may, may never be there, may never need to be there. Uh, basically, at some point, we need to pass it off to somebody that has greater capacity. We do the initial stages of development and then we hand it over you know, in some you're business not, transaction. You're not going to ma manufacture this. That's that's a deep resource kind of thing. Yes. <clears throat> you just pass it off. And passing it off means you, you give them um, what's in the patent, I guess. You give them all your know-how, how to use the platform and the genome and all. And uh, then you give them your trial, your trial information so they have that. And then they run with it. But you hold the patent all the while. Right. Um, right. Give is probably not quite the right term. Sell? Sell. Thank you. <laughs> like, well, that was my last question, Elliot. What's the economics on this? I mean, I always thought that if you had a serious disease uh, with global impact you know, and, and uh, unknown global impact, um, that there was real money in the, pharma the pharmaceutical you know, effort here. Uh, and that if you, if you hit it, hit the disease with a, with a product that works, um, that has global impact, global effect, you're going to make a lot of money, am I right? Well, our hope is it's it's a numbers game, right? I mean, we're happy to sell vaccines for a very little amount of money per person as long as we can get a huge population. And that works, you know, that's a win-win for, you know, for both the, the recipients and for ourselves. I, and the patent lasts for, what, 20, 28 years? I'm, I'm no, trying to... about 20 years. 20, 20 years. Yeah. yeah so... so it's half the life's over by the time it gets on the market. Right, that's ironic, isn't it? You spend all that time and money working it out, and then you you get there, and you only have half of the twenty years. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, so um, uh, is your work done, uh, or are you are you going to be active involved in the time trials from this uh, from this for point? Zika? Or is it, I'm talking about. We always Zika. got work to do. We have many vaccines in our pipeline right now, but for Zika, it's something that we continue to pursue. We're looking at uh, various options of what constitutes the best. Uh, vaccine or immune response to allow us to move it forward. So uh, we've done some work and with the University of Hawaii and that's where we're at at this stage. And as Elliot said, we're shopping around to find who mo might be most interested in uh, helping us to move it along. Yeah, well, one thing I get out of this conversation is that everything you do is a lesson for the next thing you do. It's a, it's a cumulative effect, cumulative knowledge. So if you solve one or make advances on one, then you're more capable of making advances on the other. Am I right about that? Mm -hmm. there, there's some truth to that, but there's, you know, there's always tricks that you know, you'll move on to another virus and it'll throw you a new curveball. So I mean, you take what you can when you learn them, but you know, every now and again they, they throw new things at you. You've got to figure that one out as you go. And the other thing I get out of this is there's a pipeline. There's always got to be a pipeline. If you want to be a successful biotech company, it's not just one product not one vaccine, you always have to be looking at other diseases and other products going forward. Yeah. And that's why we talk about platforms, to have some sort of platform you can use multiple times on multiple different infectious agents. Okay, well, David Clements, uh, we're going to take a platform now. We're going to take a short <laughs> break. Elliot, we're going to take a short break and switch out, and we're going to have some of your other products or your other research efforts in the next half of our show. Thanks very much, right. David. Thank you, Jay. Thank Elliot, you, Jay. stay around, please. All right. We'll be right back. <coughs> All right. This is Think Tech Hawaii, <laughs> raising public awareness. 
fluids. Choose to treat it with the help of a physical therapist. Physical therapists treat pain through movement and exercise. No warning labels required. And you get to actively participate in your care. <laughs> you want your drink, Choose to eh? improve your health without the risks of opioids. Choose physical therapy. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. We've got to put two in. You're going to put both of us? Yeah, so you'll be right here. Oh, you're going to put me in there? Well, now Alice should be next to him because... When I was growing up, I was among the one in six American kids who struggle with hunger. And hungry mornings make tired days. The kids in your neighborhood can think big and be more. When we're not hungry for breakfast, we're hungry for more. More ideas. More dreams. More fun. When kids aren't hungry for breakfast, they can be hungry for more. Go to hungryis.org and lend your time or your voice to make breakfast happen for kids in your neighborhood. Hey, aloha, Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. This is the place to come to think about all things energy. We talk about energy for the grid, energy for vehicles, energy in transportation, energy in maritime, energy in aviation. We have all kinds of things on our show, but we always focus on hydrogen here in Hawaii because it's my favorite thing. That's what I like to do. But we talk about things that make a difference here in Hawaii, things that should be a big changer for Hawaii, uh, and we hope that you'll join us every Friday at noon on Stand Energy Man and take a look with us at new technologies and new thoughts on how we can get clean and green in Hawaii. Aloha. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? And they told me they were making music. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to come visit with us on Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000 year odyssey, where we explore and examine the plant that the muse has given us. And stay with us as we explore all of the facets of this planet on Wednesdays at noon. Please join us. Aloha. Back, we're live in the Fellow at my left, you may recognize him. That's Elliot Parks. You saw him last half hour, and uh, he's the CEO of uh, Hawaii Biotech. But to his left, um, we have Alan Johnson, and Alan Johnson's a chemist with Hawaii Biotech, and he's working on anthrax. We're going to learn about anthrax. And to his left, we have Sean O'Malley, and he's working on botulinum, hmm, the, <clears throat> which is related to Botox. It is indeed, yes. It's scary. Um, okay, and, and in, in terms of preparing here, I want to say that, you're going to like this, that in the opera, we have the, we have the alphabet soup operas, the alphabet operas, okay, the ABC operas, okay? We have Aida, La Boheme, and Carmen. And in, in pharma, we also have the ABCs. Let me see. We got anthrax. Botulinum and cholera. Isn't that amazing the way that works? There you go. It's sort of like opera, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about mm, the A and the B, but the C is cholera. We'll have another show some we'll come other back time. Later we'll come back talk about cholera. Happy times. <laughs> so um, this is a different pipeline. These are it? these are toxin, uh, antitoxin uh, type. Not, it wouldn't call it a, a vaccine anymore. It's a small molecule this, this, drug. This fixes it after the fact or while you're sick. Right. This is entirely different, more emergent, actually. So can you talk about that, Elliot? What, what is this pipeline like? Well, the, the idea of switching gears completely is uh, Alan and Sean and the chemists uh, identify, discover, identify, and perfect small molecule drugs, you know, the kind of pills that you take, um, as opposed to biologics, which is what biotech has been doing for the last 20 years. Pharma has done small molecules for 200 years. And so Alan and Sean develop drugs that are antitoxins, block toxins that are produced by either anthrax or botulinum. You're both chemists. Correct. Why, why is a chemist important in developing antitoxins? Because small molecule drugs are chemicals. Got to know so how to put them together. Yes, we have Chemists to, are into uh, small molecules. Yeah, designing and building small molecules. 
Yeah, What's a small molecule? We're a molecular Sorry, I engineer. Asked. Yeah. Um, technically, something that's less than molecular weight, one thousand. Aspirin's a small molecule, but that's the best example. Okay. Aspirin. Most of the over-the-counter drugs that you take in pills are small molecules. Okay, as, as opposed to a large molecule. Or you can right. just, <laughs> most, bi most biologics are large proteins. You have to inject them. Okay. Yeah. These, so are, these could well be oral. It's a set okay. of a, you know, a construct of atoms that's maybe a hundred or two hundred atoms together, whereas proteins are thousands of atoms linked together. Okay. This is a significant difference. You can see it on a microscope immediately. Yeah? In an electron microscope, electron. but not a typical. <laughs> very, <laughs> very small. <laughs> but doesn't everybody have one? <laughs> so let's talk about how, how the whole thing about antitoxin and antitoxin works. Um, in the case of anthrax, um, you, you don't die from the infection, you die from the toxin. How does the toxin kill you? Actually, with anthrax, uh, both are a problem. So anthrax is somewhat unique. So the bacteria. Uh, releases the toxins to try to block the immune system. So we were talking earlier about immune systems with the vaccines. Um, basically the toxins are released, they shut down the immune system, and the immune system then cannot fight the bacteria. So the bacteria then goes on to do its nasty stuff. Which, clever! That's which really cause, clever. Yeah, like little ninjas basically. So yeah. you end up with uh, the bacteria invading all your tissues and causing um, Basically, tissue Nothing damage, right, and then sepsis occurs, and usually bad things after that. So why not just enhance the? Uh, we talked at the last uh, last part about you put these drugs in, and they help your immune system. Why not just bolster the immune system against the anthrax? Well, the vac there are vaccines for anthrax. Uh, but again, as was ah. mentioned, they if they're not taken before you're infected, they're in a, become they're not effective. Okay, okay, right. I see. So, so it's too late already. Right. So the first first line of defense for anthrax uh, is antibiotics. So you want to kill the, the bacteria as soon as possible. The problem is, is that after the bacteria has been uh, killed and your blood is say sterile, you still have all these circulating toxins in the body. Um, the other potential issue is that you could have resistance to the bacteria, by the bacteria to the antibiotic, and so you have a real problem where now you need to clearly shut down the bacteria's offense system, which is the toxins, in order to help the body clear the bacteria. Is there a point where it's too late? Yes, there is, unfortunately. <laughs> what is that point, logically? You know? um, well. I wish there was a, a clear endpoint for that. That would certainly help us with our research uh, because, unfortunately, the disease is um, asymmetric is the word that sometimes you hear. So certain people, depending on their strength and their immune system, are more susceptible, have a shorter time window for treatment than others who may have a stronger immune system. Depends on the person. Depends on the person is basically the bottom line. And so the... The point at which uh, one would call the point of no return is when the, when you really become septic. So there's a what is called a fulminant stage of the disease where the bacteria is basically running rampant. Your body cannot clear the bacteria any longer. Um, and at that point, even uh, giving antibiotics may be too late. So, mm -hmm. so Alan, how do you um, how do you build the antitoxin that will you know stop this process? The kind of, we're following the kind of classic method of uh, medicinal chemistry, as it's called, and that is basically we have the protein, the toxin itself. Uh, you, you design and build a molecule that you think will fit into the box where the active site is. So there, in this particular toxin, the toxin uh, cleaves a protein, um, several proteins in the body, which allow it to function properly. Uh, so what you're trying to do is you're trying to put something in that space so that the protein can no longer clip um, the target in the body. Okay, so you have to identify the protein first. You have to identify the protein. And is some, that a DNA kind of thing? Is that a genetic sequencing thing? Uh, actually, this was done um, through, well, my, uh, molecular biology is, is not my forte, but that's really what was the basis of the whole thing. However, we were fortunate that um, actually Merck had done some early work as well as others, as, uh, that, and they had published a crystal structure. So they actually gave us a picture of what the box looked like. 
So it was our job to try to find something that would fit tightly in You're that box. About, you sound like it's a, it's a physical fit. It is a physical fit. It fits fit. around. A lock and key. Yes. How do you like that? Yeah. And, and the box is a, is a contained space. It's a contained space. The protein does sh change its shape so because it's a dynamic kind of living thing. Um, so basically the way we do, what we do is we, it's by somewhat trial and error. Once you find a, um, let's call it a, a core structure, something that has a general correct shape, you start adding bits and pieces to it to see if you can get it to fit better. And we test those molecules just to see how well they bind to that particular box okay. site. And so once you get the right configuration, the right um, ant antitoxin material, I guess, mm -hmm. um, then it's going to what? It's going to bind to the protein and neutralize the protein. So chemically, how does that happen? How does the neutralization happen? By filling that space. It's just a matter of filling the space. Right. That they protein can, can't function if the space is filled. That's correct. Ooh, that's clever. Ooh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's classic, it's, but it, it's it elegant. Works. Uh, it, it is. <laughs> that's why it's. That's why uh, medicinal chemistry and the small molecule drugs have been around for lo so long because people thought figured this out well before us. Yeah, okay. <laughs> How far advanced are you on this uh, project? We are now in early development, which means we have selected a particular molecule that we believe will work in people, and our goal is. Um, very similar to what would be with any other therapeutic, and that is you have to demonstrate that it's safe for, for humans, and that takes several years, and that's the stage we're in right now. Mm. What about the patent? You can get a patent on this too, right, Elliot? Well, we have tried to have patents on whole families of compounds, so someone can't just tweak one end of the, again, it's the lock and key. They can't make another key that looks almost the same, but right. also fits. Prior art, but not, yeah, okay. Right. Okay, well, let, let, well, let's go to, I hope you've been listening, Sean. I have. Because I've been so, listening to this guy for a long time. So, <laughs> <laughs> so t you know, botul botulism is a really scary thing. It's uh, frequently fatal. You can tell me I'm wrong. Um, it's also, the, goes into uh, uh, plastic surgery with, uh, with uh, uh, we call it? Yeah, Botox. Botox. Um, but it's, it's really deadly. It works faster than the, am I right? The anthrax uh, toxin. Um, well, and let's it, just say it works differently. Okay, differently. And, yeah. and, and this one, this one, uh, the, the botulinum affects uh, uh, the nerve, uh, the nerve system. Right. And it, it, it neutralizes your whole nervous system, including the nerves that, uh, that drive your uh, diaphragm. So right. You can't exactly. Breathe. And that's how they, how it kills. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, it is different from anthrax in some ways and similar in some ways. So it's different in that the threat is actually not an infectious agent. You, you don't get infected by botulinum. The, the actual toxin itself is a weapon. And so what we're- It's a we're, poison. It's a poison, yeah, exactly. That protein that is, it's an, what's called an enzyme, which is a protein that has a function. And its function is to get inside the body, find a neuron, and it actually finds the nerves that attach to muscles. Uh -huh. And in the nerve, it goes in and it clips the protein machinery that is responsible for release of neurotoxin. So if you tell your muscle to contract, the muscle doesn't hear the signal anymore. Ooh, this is and, bad so that's, your diaphragm. and if that happens to your diaphragm, you Stop don't have breathing. any impulse to breathe and you die. So it, it is definitely a, a threat in terms of a weapon or in terms of a biodefense concern. It's also about 150 to 200 cases annually in the U.S. Um, for infant botulism that comes about just from uh, getting uh, the toxin. Food is also uh, an issue for spoiled food. It's an anaerobic bacterium that'll grow if there's a little bit of contamination from the soil and, and no oxygen. And so the, the issue of having the same kind of approach as we do with Alan is this, we bring a small molecule in, we try to design something that will fit into the active site of this toxin to prevent it from working in the cell so that if someone is getting sick or is pretty far gone and maybe even on the respirator, we can give them this drug after they've gotten it and the drug will go in and it'll stop the toxin from doing what it does and the body will naturally start to heal and they'll either recover more quickly or they'll never need to get on a respirator in the first place. Well, what would you rather have, uh, a bot botulism po poisoning or anthrax oh, me first, I'm a botulism guy all the way. <laughs> I guess so. Oh yeah. You're, you're yeah. Faithful, faithful to the mission. <laughs> yeah. and, and you, you have, would you rather have anthrax or botulism? No, no, I'd rather have bot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, with the, with the disease itself, untreated, um, 
typically, uh, if you're exposed to a high enough level of the bacteria, untreated, you have about seven days, period. Um, so with botulinum toxin, you've got a little bit longer time. And you, if you can get to the hospital, they can keep you right. alive. Yeah. It's very, yeah. very so it's, challenging. It's, yeah. it's a very rapid disease if it's left unchecked. Yeah. Well, um, I think the magic word here for both you guys is weaponized. Uh, because uh, 1,500 cases uh, nationwide, you know, it's not that much no. to warrant a multi-million dollar effort to, to deal with it. But if it's uh, used as a weapon, and that could happen any time, my guess is it's not that hard um, to develop these. I mean, we, ha we had an example of anthrax uh, after 9-11, after uh -huh. yeah. and botulism, you can manufacture You mentioned it. Botox. Yeah. And actually, there is an issue because Botox is something that... Uh, as a medical application of the toxin, so it it stops nerves from overacting, so it can relax muscles that are too tight. So everyone knows about wrinkles, but there's actually over 200 uses of it medically, and it has to do with conditions, any condition in which the muscles are contracted, <coughs> palsy issues, uh, oh, yeah. recovery from uh, dramatic surgery or war injuries. Uh, it's even finding uses in pain, um, phantom limb pain and migraine. And so, for that reason, there are now seven countries internationally that all manufacture Botox. So you can imagine that that means there's more access to this potential weapon. Sure. And that and has us a little concerned. The guys who manufacture Botox could just as easily manufacture botulism. It, just last year, uh, Iran started manufacturing it for oh, medical purposes, that's for example. scary. What a bunch of guys over there, honestly. So, um, what, what's it, is it by a pill or, uh, or what? Uh, you mentioned before the show that um, that if you can't digest, if, you're, if your nerves are uh, messed up on your digestive system where you're swallowing, uh, then you may not be able to swallow a pill. So how do, how do you, uh, how do you I think initially, this? initially the drug for botulism would probably be IV, assuming that that's going to be given to somebody who's uh, in the ICU already. Now, on the other hand, if you're thinking about a situation where there's a large-scale terrorism event, you may also want to be giving it to people who haven't yet developed symptoms, but who have likely been exposed. And in that case, a pill form may also be useful. Easier, so yeah. probably first is IV, and then you'd follow that up immediately with uh, something that's easier to distribute to a large number of people. What about an anthrax, the antitoxin and anthrax? How do you administer that pill? Pill, yes, yeah. that's, uh, that's our, our, certain, our, cer our current target for delivery. Because uh, again, if you, look at a, if you look at a mass casualty event, say, someone releases a couple of kilograms of spores from an airplane over Honolulu, you're going to infect 300,000, 400,000 people. Thank you for mentioning that. And how do, you, how do you treat all those people? You can't have them line up and uh, I'll get an injection that would take five days to, to, in, to in, inoculate and everybody. So, pills is what you gotta do. Yeah, we know the Postal Service does a pretty good job of delivering the mail every day, so you could potentially be delivered through the mail. Yeah. They could deliver the powder, they could deliver the pills. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. <laughs> so, I Elliot, didn't hear this anything. is all so encouraging. <laughs> Hawaii Biotech is reaching a whole new height here with all these things in the pipeline. This is so exciting that I'm here with you. I'm only two feet away from you. I'm so excited. So <clears throat> where are we in terms of Hawaii Biotech? Where are we in terms of biotech in Hawaii? Where, where, where is this all going? Is this, is this going to be as big as I think? Well, what Hawaii Biotech does is going to be big, clearly. I mean, we, we've, we're well established. We have good funding. We have great programs, if you've seen. Um, you know, we, we don't hire hundreds of people, but we hire a couple people a year. And we, as I said before, we bring in interns from UH. Uh, and so we'll be here to stay for a while. Great. Uh, you know, whether we're going to have 50 companies like, like Hawaii Biotech here, probably not. But, you know, sometimes quality is important as, as important as quantity. We can all be proud. We are proud. You are a bright light. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Kelly Park. <laughs> thank uh, you. Alan Johnson. Thanks. Was that suitably Sean operatic Riley. for you? Great. <laughs> <laughs> Don't touch me. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Right, thank you. <laughs> you like to touch me. <laughs>